Καλησπέρα, Αθήνα. Good afternoon, Athens. Thank you for having me today. Fiat currency and BitPay, a payment system for Bitcoin. Last week, the committee returned to hearing witnesses directly involved with one of the digital currencies, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin Embassy, the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada, and the Bitcoin Foundation. Today, we are pleased to welcome Mr. Andreas Antonopoulos, considered to be the Bitcoin guru. You want disrupt? I got disrupt. No, I've got downright revolution. We're going to talk about the most exciting, most interesting, and probably the most important technological innovation, no invention in computer science of the last 20 years. I'm here to talk about Bitcoin. Saying Bitcoin is digital money is like saying the internet is a fancy telephone. It's like saying that the internet is all about email. Money is just the first application. Bitcoin is a technology, it is a currency, and it is an international network of payments and exchange that is completely decentralized. It doesn't rely on banks, it doesn't rely on governments. And we have never done this before in the history of humanity. So let's get started. Bitcoin is digital money. It's money just like euros or dollars, only it's not owned by a government. And you can send it from any point in the world to any other point in the world, instantaneously, securely, and for minimal or no fees at all. I think we've been heading in towards a cashless society that's trackable, and that's credit cards and wire transfers and bank accounts. Bitcoin allows you to take control of your money, and that control can be exercised with innovation at the edge that allows you to re-inject privacy and anonymity as necessary, and that will make it a very powerful force for individuals. It actually forces governments to be more transparent and allows individuals to be more private. The current experiment of fiat-based currencies that are not tied to any tangible goods that are used to fund war, that are issued by central banks, with income taxation directly out of a worker's paycheck, is a 60-year failed experiment. We have the opportunity not to bank the other six billion, but to unbank all seven billion of us. We have the opportunity to allow the developing world to leapfrog directly from their current state of cash-based societies to digital cash societies and bypass the entire fiasco failed experiment of central currencies that we've experimented with in the Western world. And they're going to take this opportunity, just like they leapfrogged landlines and went directly to cell phones. So Bitcoin is the money of the people. At its center, simple mathematical rules that everyone agrees on and no controls. There is some kind of weird internet money when in fact Bitcoin is so much more. I mean, Bitcoin is a technology that allows you to transfer asset value across the internet instantly, securely, and cheaply. And that has a lot more implications than just money. Uh, it can be used for stock markets and bonds. It can be used for legal contracts. It can be used to do settlement on a house. It can be used for all kinds of things we haven't even imagined yet. Bitcoin isn't just money for the internet. It's the internet of money. Um, but I'm talking about inflation. So if you, uh, people generally don't understand how inflation works. If they did, they'd be horrified, because then they would realize that they're being robbed on a daily basis. Um, I think it was Ford who said that if, uh, if the common people ever understand how central banking works, there'll be a revolution. He was probably right. Most people really don't understand how money works. The idea that an organization in the U.S. is even more bizarre. The Federal Reserve Bank is not a government body. Who knew that? Did you know that? It's a private company. It's a private company made up of member banks. And they create money out of nothing, and then they use that money to buy treasury bills, and put the government into debt against the money that they give their own member banks. Now, if you try to explain this to a five-year-old, they will very quickly point out that if you give someone the ability to make money, they're going to rob you blind, because a five-year-old will get that. Right? You have to be an adult to miss that point. <laughs> you have to be a very, very serious adult who says, no, 
The Federal Reserve Bank uh, offers stability for our currency by carefully manipulating interest exchange rates on overnight banking loans between banks, thereby establishing a smooth business cycle between boom and bust, and allowing for the uh, allocation of capital efficiently in the markets. Which is all a very long way of saying they're robbing you blind. Now, if you then try to explain to the average person what 2% inflation is, there's two ways to explain it. You can say, well, 2% inflation means that every year your money uh, reduces in actual purchasing value by 2%. And they'll try to do the math in their head, and if they're like me, they'll fail. They'll pull out a calculator and try to do it again, probably fail again, because compound interest is kind of tricky like that. Or there's a simple way to do it. In 36 years, everything is twice as expensive. What? You mean I save for 36 years, and then I've got $100,000 in the bank, but it's only worth 50 in today's money? Those guys are robbing us blind. <laughs> but most people really don't think about money. Money is something that pervades our life, but most people don't think about it. Because we don't really understand it. And I challenge you to try to explain money to a five-year-old. And you will very quickly find out that they start asking questions to which you don't have the answers. Most people don't have the answers to these questions. Uh, and the reason they don't have the answers to these questions is because most people don't understand money. Uh, money, while it is used by all of us, is something almost mystical in nature. Why does a piece of cotton that is... Well, let's say it's 60% cotton, 20% bacteria, and 20% cocaine, to be more accurate. <laughs> a piece of cotton printed with green ink, why does that have value? And you have that discussion with people around you and see what they answer. Some people are going to give you this line. Well, you see, for every dollar out there in circulation, there's a certain amount of gold in the vault at Fort Knox. I have news for you. There is no gold. <laughs> Right? That system of money was abolished in the Bretton Woods Treaty in 1936 or 33? 46. So that system doesn't exist. This particular solution, this invention, is far more important than currency. Currency is just the first app, just the first application that you can build on a distributed consensus system. Other applications include distributed fair voting, stock ownership, asset registration and notarization, and also many other applications we've never thought of before. Because now the authority is not derived from the sovereignty of the issuer, from the printing press of a nation and state that can declare through monopoly and use of force that this is the currency you will use. Now we can choose currency, and a five-year-old can create currency. And maybe the currency that the five-year-old created has a monetary value. Maybe it doesn't. Most likely it doesn't. Some will. And so we need to get used to a world where we have to judge currency not by who issued it, but by who uses it. Or rather, how many people use it and what they use it for. So let's imagine a world in which currency is being used in a widespread fashion, and no one remembers who created the currency or why. They only know that within their local community, it has purchasing power. As a little fanciful thought, imagine a decade from now, in a rural village, far detached from our developed nation civilization, villagers exchanging two currencies. One, that has a Shiba Inu, a Japanese breed of dog, on the front, and is pronounced doggy coin or doge coin or dog coin, and I'm not quite sure, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but you can buy half a dozen eggs with it. And other villagers are trading another currency that has an old white lady called Elizabeth on it, and they have no idea who Elizabeth is, and they don't know why she got her picture on the coin. Maybe she wrote a nice song. Maybe she won Canadian Teen Idol. Nobody remembers anymore, but you can buy six eggs with it. And to those people, it doesn't matter who issued the currency. What matters is whether it has purchasing power or not. The currency is now evaluated purely on its monetary basis, 
because of adoption, because of use, and there is one fundamental difference between those two currencies. One has a predictable, stable, algorithmic monetary supply, and the other has an old white lady called Elizabeth on it. So, in fact, one of them has some real intrinsic value, because it has removed some of the uncertainty of the monetary system from it. The other one doesn't, really. We need to get ready to live in a world where multiple currencies will coexist. So currency as a means of expression, currency as a tool of language, is no longer up to the issuer. It is up to us as individuals making a choice to use that currency, and we give it value through our use. We give it value through adoption. And we will be surprised by some of the currencies that will emerge from a fad, that will emerge from a joke, perhaps even a sick joke and will explode into viral consciousness on the internet, and then become real monetary powers in use across a broad population, surprising all of us. Now, some of you may have heard of Bitcoin as a currency, as a system of money, that is currently going wildly high in price one day, and wildly low in price the other day. And what I am here to tell you is to ignore the price, and to ignore Bitcoin the money, and understand Bitcoin, the technology, the invention, and the network it creates. Because if we mess up the money, we'll just reboot another currency. The invention of Bitcoin, the technology that makes it possible, cannot be uninvented. And it creates the possibility for decentralized organization on a scale never before seen on this planet. This is a nature of decentralized systems by diffusing power. You see, the mistake is to think that you can somehow stop the accumulation of power by finding that one honest person, giving them all the power and hoping they act well. And that always fails. Um, the only way to stop centralization of power is to diffuse power, so that even though there will be bad actors, they don't have enough power to affect the entire system. And that's exactly what Bitcoin does. What it does is it takes the power of intermediary institutions and says, "Hey, thank you so much for acting as a clearinghouse. Uh, we really appreciate your service over these many, many years, uh, which you did and toiled uh, for the measly sum of five to twelve percent of our income. But uh, we just replaced you with a hundred lines of Python code. So uh, thank you very much. We'll take it from here." <laughs> and. And you don't need, and then you can start saying, "Well, I can do clearing of transactions for a third of a penny." And, and why do we need you exactly? And so you cut out one intermediary. Uh, we could do this in the rentances market, for example, and say, "So Western Union, what you do is you use other people's networks to move money from one country to another, and for that incredible service that only takes five to seven days, you charge us 10 percent. Well, thank you very much for your service, but we just replaced your industry with a hundred lines of Python code, so bye-bye now. <laughs> and this is going to keep happening. We saw this in the internet. I remember in the early days on the internet, system administrators would go around with a t-shirt that said, I just replaced you with a, with a script. Um, and we can really do that now for financial services. The truth is that the vast majority of innovation that has happened in financial services over the last 20 years has been primarily in finding ways to cheat consumers and cheat markets. It's been about high frequency trading, algo trading, sequencing transactions, front running transactions, and extracting as much fees as possible from consumers. And consumers don't benefit from that. So when you give consumers an alternative and they begin to experience that, they start noticing things. People also ask me, how do we make Bitcoin successful? And it's like, you don't really need to market something that works. Bitcoin is useful. Just demonstrate it to people. And then they'll see that Bitcoin doesn't have banking hours, doesn't take three to five business days to clear, won't freeze your account, won't take a $35 fee if you don't have enough money. And uh, by the way, Target just got compromised, 60 million accounts got stolen, Bitcoin doesn't give a shit. <laughs> right? Because we don't work that way. So, these are the simple, usable, and useful characteristics of this currency, and those things once demonstrated to people. Now we've got a long way to go to make it easy and secure and straightforward. Just like when I got on the internet and I had to go through all of that, I never expected my mom would send an email. By the way, exactly 20 years to the day after I sent my first email, my mother sent her first email on an iPad by swiping a finger across a screen. 
And it took 20 years to deliver that level of ease of use and functionality. But I have no doubt that she's going to use Bitcoin at some point, and it's going to be a lot easier, and it's not going to take us 20 years, because this time we have the internet. Okay. I also like to address the issues of crime and money laundering on Bitcoin, because that's something that comes up often, and it's such a ridiculous issue. Uh, if you watch the Senate hearings on Bitcoin, only one of the senators really grasped some of the disruptive effects and started asking questions about how this would affect the monetary policy of the Fed. All of the other ones were talking about whether there would be money laundering on this new payment network, completely missing the point. Uh, first of all, out of the seven and a half billion people on this planet, how many of them are going to use Bitcoin for criminal purposes, and how many of them are going to use it to achieve personal empowerment? There's more of us than there are criminals. Secondly, the vast majority of crime happens on one currency, the U.S. dollar, in cash, everywhere. If I manage somehow to buy a joint for Bitcoin on the Silk Road, I've added a tiny amount of Bitcoin to a pipeline that has been funded from planting to cultivation to distribution to processing to smuggling, all the way until it reaches me. Right? And, uh, I can't roll up a Bitcoin and use it to actually snort the drugs up my nose. <laughs> but you can do that with a dollar. <laughs> this is a distraction. And it's not an arbitrary distraction. It's a very deliberate distraction. distraction. On the internet, when we started using the internet, and I was on in 1989 as a teenager, but really got into it around 1991. I remember clearly the internet was not an engine of innovation and growth. The internet was a den of thieves, pornographers, and terrorists. <laughs> and that's exactly how it was portrayed by the media. And we were answering the exact same questions about the internet then, which was, what do you mean anyone can publish? What do you mean anyone can say anything without any controls? Society will implode. That's impossible. We can't do that. And so now we're having the same conversation. What do you mean people can send money anywhere in the world without controls? Well, guess what? That's how it's always been. Bitcoin is not a company. It's not an organization. It is a standard or a protocol just like TCPIP or the internet. It's not owned by anyone. It operates by simple mathematical rules that everyone who participates in the network agrees on. And through this simple mechanism, and through the invention of Satoshi Nakamoto, Bitcoin is able to allow a completely decentralized network of computers to agree on what transactions have occurred on a network, essentially agreeing on who ha currently has the money. Do you have any concerns about a large nation state that has um, interest in just actively destroying Bitcoin? to make their own you know, super rigs and uh, design chips and just throw hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to intentionally disrupt the blockchain. Yeah, I, I don't worry about that at all. Um, this cannot be done with Bitcoin anymore. This is something that can only be done with nascent altcoins. Uh, Bitcoin has achieved a, a level of computing that uh, no single nation state can, uh, can overthrow it through computation alone. Uh, the effort to do so would require a massive covert operation of chip fabrication, uh, then the coordinated assault that would give them dominance over the next block for ten minutes until we kick those bastards off the network, uh, rework the protocol around them, they would be revealed, they would have lost a billion dollars doing this, and all they got to do was one double spend. <laughs> now here's the thing. Long before we get to that point, they figure out that if they just let this stuff run, they can actually get some Bitcoin <laughs> as a reward, because the incentive structure actually works. And so I'm not worried about that. Um, this is the kind of heavy-handed action that can, that can drive conspiracy theory, but is really only applicable on a small scale for a small altcoin. Governments aren't good at doing massive conspiracy. They're good at doing small conspiracy, but massive conspiracy like that doesn't go unnoticed. And a lot of people are watching the blockchain. And as I said before, what are they going to do? So they take over and they fork the blockchain and they go somewhere. Right? They've created an alternative blockchain. Great. What are we going to do? Who's going to join the NSA blockchain? <laughs> Anybody want to jump on Fedcoin? <laughs> so we're all going to stay on the old fork. Difficulty will go down. 
It will get more profitable for the miners who stayed behind, and we'll carry on with our coin, and they can go mine whatever the hell they want on their alternative blockchain. They achieve nothing. They can't make protocol changes because, we, as I said, five constituencies in consensus, and it would take a billion dollars to pull the most ridiculous Keystone Cops failure in history. <laughs> Plus, this would actually require a government that can do IT. <laughs> You think they could organize a massive mining ring? Uh, uh, go check out uh, healthcare.gov. <laughs>